Welcome to our webinar today. I see you, Ruth, from Central Florida, Palm, West Palm Beach area. I see you. Julia, welcome. I see you, Hilda, our resident epidemiologist. Welcome. I see you, Esther, our expert from Minneapolis. I see you there. And Rita, I see you. Brenda, welcome Thank you. our resident expert from Toronto, Canada. I am excited to see you all here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're just going to take time to wait for other people to log on um, and then we will get started. Um, thank you for taking time to share your Saturday afternoon for those of you on Eastern time and your evening for those who are calling in from Eastern Africa. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. I am on central time, so it is still 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is a joy to, to have everybody here today. And if you would like to turn your video on, we would be happy to see your faces as well. There is no shame with our backgrounds. <laughs> Whatever you have in your background is fine. So thank you for joining us. Right, we'll just take a couple of minutes and um, just um, see if a couple more people will log in before we get started. There's a lot of awareness issues this month, so we had to pick one and I picked sexual assault uh, awareness. I will also honor that it is uh, autism awareness month this month. Um, and we will probably um, have a conversation around that. Welcome, Carol, uh, for, for joining us. Welcome, Zipora, Zippy, joining us from Lancaster. That's another mental health professional. Um, I'm going to applaud all of you practitioners because I see most of you here practitioners and I, I'm just glad you could call in because this is really an important conversation to have. I'll just give it another minute and then we will get started. All right, and we are streaming um, on Facebook. If you're able to see our link, we are streaming from my page. So if you'd like to go to my page and share that link, um, so other people who may not log in and register can also be able to join people who are in your network and may not be in my network um, can be able to join as well and view. Um, all right. So we're going to go ahead and, um, and get started. Um, so wonderful to see everybody today. Um, it is a joy to, to be able to um, interact with all of you and to just have you join us on the webinar today. I'm going to kindly ask that when we are not speaking that we would uh, mute ourselves and especially all of us uh, participants that we may just stay on mute so that we don't have interference uh, during the webinar. Um, and so I'm going to just go ahead and, and start us off by saying that it is, it is really a brave conversation that we're going to have here today um, around uh, sexual assault um, awareness and ending violence in our community. I call this Take Back the Night um, because I really want us to not just take back the night, take back the African night. I'm going to ask to mute ourselves when we are not um, engaging. Um, and I, I just uh, decided to make this take back the African night because those of you who are in the field already, you know that uh, for myself, especially working on a college campus, we have uh, take back the night as um, an event that we have every April for sexual assault awareness month, especially in a residential uh, college campus. We do that for the residential students in terms of taking back the night in terms of a lot of assault happens in the night um, and happens behind closed doors. And I, I have never had anybody do a take back the African night. So I decided that we would do that today. And so um, 
I want us to have a conversation around that. And we usually have a very, people have a diverse perspective of what sexual assault is. And I just wanted to take a moment to talk about just a couple of things around what sexual assault is and, um, and what it means to, to be assaulted and what's the definition of that? Because people tend to think about this um, in different ways and different definitions. So let me see if I can find my, my slides with a couple of, of definitions on, on what sexual assault is. Uh, let's see if I can find that um, and share that with you. I'll share my screen. Okay, come on. All right, it is not allowing me to share my screen for some reason. Um, okay, so I will talk off of my slides, but I don't know why it will not let me share. Um, okay, so let me just talk about what sexual assault is. So sexual assault is a term, the term sexual assault refers to sexual contact or behavior that occurs without explicit consent of the victim. And some form of um, sexual assault include rape or attempted um, rape, uh, fondling or unwanted sexual touching, forcing a victim to perform sexual acts, watching someone engage in private acts without their knowledge or their permission, non-consensual image sharing, sexual harassment, sexual exploitation and trafficking, or even exposing one's genitals or naked bodies to other people without their consent. I know some of those we think they're really passive and they're not a big deal, but they are a big deal and they do have an impact on people's functioning. Um, and so I wanted just to make sure we have an understanding of what uh, sexual assault actually entails. Um, and when we think about assault, this, this, this is just such a broad topic, we will not have time to cover everything, but how sexual abuse is another piece that tends to be overlooked that can, we can have a very narrow definition of it, but some of the things that are included within child sexual abuse is things like uh, exhibitionism or exposing yourself to a minor, fondling, intercourse, masturbation in the presence of a minor, or forcing the minor to masturbate in front of um, an adult or another person, obscene phone calls, text messages, uh, digital interactions with the sexual content. Um, that is uh, sexual abuse if you're doing that with a minor, producing, owning, or sharing pornographic images or movies of children. That is sexual abuse, that is sexual assault, and that's violating man minors. Sex of any kind with a minor, whether it's virginal, whether it's oral, whether it's anal, that is sexual abuse. It does not mean that it has to be what we'd call traditional sexual acts. Sex trafficking uh, is child sexual abuse and any other sexual conduct that is harmful to a child's mental, emotional or physical welfare is something that we consider to be sexual abuse. And this is important to talk about within the African context because we can be very minimalistic in what can be categorized as sexual assault, even to adults. And so I just wanted to mention that even if people engage in sexting without your consent, without the consent of the recipient of those texts, that is sexual assault. Um, even though most of the time people may be like, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. And later on, I'll talk about uh, invalidation and what that really um, is and what that means Oh, is, is my, my stuff sharing now? Let me stop sharing. Um, something is going on with my technology today that it's just acting up on its own. Um, and all of us are aware about um, the Me Too movement. Are people aware of what the Me, Me Too movement is about? And that actually is um, a really, if, if you've not heard about the Me Too movement, that is a movement that's defined as a social movement against sexual violence um, and sexual assault that advocates for females who survive sexual violence to speak up about their experiences. And that has been, people have become very vocal and even male, especially male celebrities have 
come behind the women in talking about um, just speaking up because a lot of times there's been a voice that has tried to silence people, especially when the assault or the sexual violence has been by the perpetrator has been a celebrity. There's been a reaction sometimes to say, you know, we're making it up um, or, you know, that these are people who are gold diggers, they just want money, they have a motive. And so there's been a lot more attention bringing up the idea of what the, what the victim experiences is what is sexual assault. It doesn't matter the power because most of sexual assault is about power. And so the awareness that it doesn't matter who the perpetrator is, we should not invalidate the experience um, of the victim and what the experience was based on the perpetrator. And so those are the conversations I want us to have today because sometimes the voice of African people, especially the victims is very silenced. And today we have two experts join us and they will take time to talk to us about sexual assault and just the impact of that. How do we cope with it? What does it even look like? But I wanted to just open up by sharing those two pieces about what is it that falls under that category, even sexual harassment, things that, you know, somebody just brushing on you without your consent and you feel violated, that is sexual assault. And I know laws are different uh, in every state in terms of what is categorized as that, especially when we're talking about minors. So it's important for those of you in the US to actually be aware of what the law says in your state about sexual assault and be able to give a voice to victims. So without much further ado, I want to invite our first um, panelist um, who is a really good friend of mine. I totally enjoy spending time with her, Dr. Ajab Amin. Uh, she's a licensed psychologist who's also a blogger and private practitioner. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Biobehavioral Health from Penn State and a Master's of Public Health from the University of Michigan. I did not know that you got your MPH from Michigan. I'm a Wolverine, as you know, so we need to connect on that. She earned her doctorate in counseling psychology from Northwest University. She currently practices psychotherapy. She's part of a group practice. Uh, in Philly and also uh, conducts biblical counseling as well. She has experience working therapeutically with various age groups, but presently focuses on adults providing individual and couples counseling. So her experience includes college counseling. She's been in the, in the area where I work, community center counseling, private and group practice. She founded the blog, uh, which is called African Mind Healer. You can actually find that at www.africanmindhealer.com. We're going to put that information in the chat box so you can follow her. And she writes on mental health, culture, faith, while providing mental health resources to those um, seeking help. She is originally from Cameroon, and she lives in Philly. So without uh, going further, I'm going to yield the floor to my friend, uh, Dr. Ijab Amin. You're on, my sister. All right. Well, thanks, Dr. Lil. So many good things already. Um, I'm, I'm really appreciative of this time for all of you guys to be here and for Dr. Lil inviting me to speak. Um, I'm looking forward to learning as well from the next speaker. Um, and even just the, the conversation that we've already started has already shown me a lot about you know, different aspects of um, sexual assault that sometimes we don't talk about. So I'm going to share my screen. I hope this works. <laughs> okay, I think it does. Awesome. All right, great. So that works. Um, yeah, so I would just begin by saying there are public health implications of sexual assaults, um, such as um, sexually transmitted diseases, unwanted pregnancies, you know, physical safety, being concerned about um, just where where to live if this person that was perpetuating is someone who lives in the house and is the sole provider. Um, there may be concerns for that. So there, there are a lot of public health implications. And this conversation or this particular slide that I'm going to present is not about that. So it's more about the personal impact, um, thinking about what goes on with someone who has been sexually assaulted in terms of their feelings, their mental state, 
and all the insights, the internal things that may not be so physically obvious. So Dr. Lou already explained all of this, um, which just tells you a little bit about myself. The only thing that I would add there is um, I'm a Christian. And so there are a few things that I will talk about that may relate to a Christian perspective. Um, yeah, and I'm originally from Cameroon. I think she mentioned that as well. Okay, so I want to begin by just some definitions. You know, sometimes we, you know, we throw out things like self-knowledge, self-worth, worth, self esteem, esteem, and we don't really know what it means. And sometimes we could think it is the same thing, but it's not. And so I want to start by us understanding what um, self-worth and self-esteem are, and then. Um, as you guys are listening to the presentation, kind of think of how these two things are being impacted and how if somebody who has been sexually assaulted, um, just think about your self-worth and your self-esteem and how that has been impacted by this trauma. So self-worth, the main question that someone who, um, uh, someone who is thinking about your self-worth, the main question they're asking is, am I valuable? Am I lovable? Uh, this is the intrinsic lovable aspect of someone, just knowing that you are human and so you are worth something just for the fact that you were created, you have needs, you have wants, um, and all these are common to all of us, right? All of us need to sleep, all of us need to eat, we need connection, we need peace, uh, we want to be content. These are the basic things that make us human. And these are the things that make us worthy. So for people who will identify as Christians, you can think about it um, in terms of the fact that God decided to create you, giving you all the abilities, attributes, all the things that you are. He looked at the whole world and thought about making you. Uh, so this in itself makes you worthy. And so this is self-worth. While self-esteem, the main question that is being asked is, can I be kind? Can I be smart? You know, can I do um, engineering, right? Can I cook, right? You're, you're talking about your personal abilities and looks like, am I, am I beautiful, right? You're, you're taking a more um, personal view at what you can and you cannot do. And so these are what we think, feel, and believe about ourselves. So it comes from gathering evidence about how, how you are as a person, right? You might realize I'm not so good at math. I'm not so good at cooking, right? All of these things, these are attributed to self-esteem. So what does, what does ideal self-esteem and self-worth look like, right? Ideally, when you have a healthy self-esteem. And I, I say healthy instead of saying high, because if you have a too high self-esteem, then you can become narcissistic. And this is where you believe, you exaggerate all your positive qualities and you don't think of your faults and you don't really care about other people. Uh, so it's all about you. You just think you're, you're the best thing that happened and everybody else, does not really matter, right? So too high self-esteem can be detrimental. And too low self-esteem is where you mostly only look at your negative qualities and you don't believe that you are capable of doing, doing a lot of good things. So what we want is a sober judgment or an honest look at yourself. So being able to accept yourself for all the things that you are, the things that you are great at, the things that you are not so good at, the things that just make you, you, uh, your traits, your qualities, your weaknesses, all of that. So that is healthy self-esteem. And then healthy self-worth will be recognizing that you are lovable and valuable regardless of these things, like regardless of all of these qualities that you have, all of these, um, weaknesses you have, you are valuable just because you're here, like just because, you know, God chose to put you on this earth. 
Um, and so you can accept all of your humanity. You can accept the fact that you need rest and sleep. You need self-care. You need um, you need what all the things you need um, in order to to live to survive. So these are the two things. So these this is these are the healthy things that we're going off of, and this is where we want to start. Right, we're looking at this is ideal. Um, and so what happens when someone has been sexually assaulted? So starting with just what are the thoughts? What are some of the thoughts, right? There are a lot of thoughts, uh, which we don't have a lot of time to go over each one of them. But some of the questions and the things that go on in their minds are, I should have known better. Like, why, why did I go out that night? Maybe I should have known better. It was my fault. I could have stopped it. I, I feel used. I am worthless, right? As you can see all of these thoughts, you're starting to see this person's self, self-worth, self-esteem. These things are starting to crumble, right? And what about other people? What do other people say to the person? People sometimes ask, sometimes ask questions such as, are you sure that's what happened? What were you wearing? Stop lying, right? Maybe you're reading too much into this, but he's your husband, right? Like he can, right? it doesn't really matter. Like you guys are married, right? These are different statements, different questions that um, people may ask, but really what somebody in this, somebody who has been sexually assaulted, what they want is, is they just want someone to say, I believe you, right? They want someone to listen and actually acknowledge what has happened to them, right? This is some of what Dr. Lil was, was talking to, was talking about. So what is the impact, right? Like what does that do to someone's self self to someone's self, right? As you can see from the previous slides, there is a lot of self-doubt, self-blame, self-hate, right? A lot of inward. It becomes inward. It becomes about me. What did I do? What did I not do? How could I, should I have stopped it, right? There's a lot of shame and worthlessness that people begin to feel. And just a little difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is when somebody has done something wrong, right? I have done something wrong that is feeling guilt, but shame is who you are. So it's, I am a bad person. I am worthless. That is a shame. So, but both of these things affects self-esteem and self-worth. And another thing that people could ask or question themselves is I felt some pleasure. So maybe I wanted it, right? They start doubting that. But naturally we have pleasure receptors in our genitals, right? And God put that there for a good reason. But um, when, and so, but what that means is that regardless of what type of sex um, or who is doing the se sexual act, you can feel some pleasure. And that's just for the biological fact of that you have those pleasure receptors. And so the fact that you felt something, that you felt some pleasure does not mean that you wanted it, does not mean that it's your fault, does not mean that um, you were not sexually assaulted, right? But these are some of the questions and the concerns that someone may have. Another impact is broken trust, right? Like the person may not know who to trust anymore. They, maybe they trusted this person and this person violated them. So broken trust, there's a damaged sense of safety, right? Like, can I feel safe? Can I feel safe? Who can I feel safe with? And then also maybe the world starts to become unsafe. There is difficulty trusting one's own self, right? Can I trust myself? I said no, but this person took advantage of me. And so how do I know how to trust myself anymore? People can also begin to feel discomfort with their own body. Either they, um, they don't feel like their body really belongs to them because there's a feeling of being used, right? And so they get all these 
discomfort with how they feel in their own body. There are also relationship difficulties, um, not only in terms of romantic relationships, but also relationships in general, because once trust is broken, there is this alert, hyper alertness that causes people to constantly look around to wonder like who's really on my side right like who can i trust right so relationship difficulties and then problems with intimacy intimacy not only in terms of sexual intimacy um, which becomes um, an issue where you have some people who um when they're having maybe sexual in when they're sexually intimate with your partners they may uh, start thinking about what happened to them and so they may want to stop or they may not feel as comfortable anymore. So that affects sexual intimacy, but it also just affects being intimate with other people in terms of like emotional intimacy, which goes along with trust. So as you guys are kind of looking at this, just see how, how much it affects someone's um, evaluation of their self, right? Just more on that, uh, sexual assault has been shown to um, be related to a lot of other um, clinical issues such as depression, anxiety, suicidal behavior, um, and suicidal behavior is correlated with low self-worth and low self-esteem. In children, right, there's, it's uh, correlated with low self-esteem, which has triggered internet use amongst kids, um, and this also correlates with internet addiction. Right, so as you can see, it starts it starts in one place and then it just starts to spiral into other clinical issues, which can also lead to addictions such as um, alcoholism, drugs, overuse, and pornography. And part of what these addictions are is a coping tool, right? People who have been sexually assaulted have been traumatized. And so what that causes is there's a lot of either their flashbacks or their thoughts around what happened or there's intense emotions. And part of being able to manage that, people could, uh, could use drugs and alcohol to try to cope with the distress of that um, so that they don't think about it as much or so that they can numb the pain. But that in itself also leads to another addiction. So as you can see, there's just, there are a lot of repercussions. So let's think, just thinking a little bit, I mean, all of this, the things that I already spoke about can affect all of us, right? But when we think about African cultures, their our cultures are really geared towards respect and high power distance, right? So you need to respect your elders, respect authority, um, respect your husbands, respect you know, those above you, respect your parents, right? So this, there's this high power distance. And if you can think of high power distance as different from um, the US, for example, which has does not have a high power distance. Um, an example of that will be if, you know, like when I came to the US, you know, you have college professors who tell you like, yeah, call me by my first name, like call me Bob. Right, that's something that we will not do back home. Back home, you have to call the person professor or doctor or teacher, right? You cannot just call them by their first name. So that's an example of just power distances. Um, so in African cultures with cultures of respect, either you call your elders uncle, auntie, or you call them doctor, you know, prof, right? Like there's this, this respect culture. So this um, in itself is not a bad thing, but for the context of sexual assault, it can be really difficult for children or women to speak up because, um, especially if the person was someone in authority or someone um, who is a leader, someone who um, is older than them, because there's this, this aspect of respect. And then sometimes moms also feel the need to protect uh, dads or to protect their husbands or themselves because they're concerned about um, their children. Maybe they're concerned for safety. Maybe the dad is the sole provider in the household. And so what happens, right? Where do they go, right? So there is this aspect of wanting to protect the person um, 
and parents want their children, could want their children to be cordial. Again, respect, right? The respect aspects. You have to respect your uncle or relative who molested them. And, and so the child can feel like they have not been heard um, or this was not taken seriously enough, right? So there's also the aspect of women not standing up for other women, right? Blaming the victim can be a big deal. And part of that also relates to this aspect of power, like knowing that this person who was a leader, for example, is a person who, um, who did the assaults. It can be difficult for us to understand and to even accept that somebody who is a leader, especially if this person has done a lot of good things for the community, right? We've heard of pastors who have molested um, people. We've heard of um, ministers, leaders, right? If these people are respectable people who are doing good things for the community, it can be really difficult for for the rest of the for the rest of us to um, to accept that they can also do something that is so despicable, right? Something that we, and that, that we consider terrible. And so in our minds to try to convince ourselves that, you know, the world is beautiful, right? We can just deny it. But that, um, because part of us accepting that this happens means that we'll have to change the way we think. We have to, we'll have to accept that the world is not perfect and that people, the same people can do really good things and do really bad things at the same time. And that is just very difficult for us to accept. And so we can just deny it and blame the victim and, um, and let the person suffer. So these are things um, that have huge a huge impact on the person who has been sexually assaulted. Talking a little bit about boundaries, right? Because Part of when an assault happens, what that does is it breaks the boundaries, right? Like somebody has violated your boundaries, your physical boundaries. And the physical boundaries are kind of the basic level of boundaries, right? I know that my body is my body, right? You cannot tell me that my hand is not my hand. I know that this is, this is mine. And so when somebody violates uh, and breaks that, what that does is it can make the person question every aspect of boundaries, right? All the other boundaries become blurry. It becomes difficult to say no to things. Um, it becomes difficult to know like, what are my wants and my needs versus what, you, what are your wants and your needs? Um, and it can be challenging to assert themselves um, and to assert their needs. And they may constantly find themselves working to make others happy or to get rid of the feelings of pain and um, discomfort that they feel with themselves. So part of these broken boundaries really not only has an effect on physical boundaries, but also impacts the emotional boundaries that this person um, begins to have. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about men because when we think about sexual assault, a lot of times we think about women, um, but men have been sexually assaulted too. And um, there are a lot of grown men now who were sexually assaulted when they were boys. Uh, and that still has an effect. And especially it's difficult for them to admit that this happened to them because of the shame, because we live in societies where that are male dominant and so admitting that you're sexually assaulted as a man can really have, um, uh, uh, can bring an implication where people could be perceived as weak. So this makes a lot of men silent about what happened and it does not take away the consequences because this, may, this, um, this sexual assault amongst men, it shows up, it can show up later um, in male depression. And male depression can look a little different in that it can show up in terms of anger, anger outbursts, 
um, the needing to control, the need to be busy all the time. Part of the, what that busyness does, it, it keeps them controlling. It keeps them managing things so they don't get to look at how they're feeling, um, at how they're really doing. And it keeps them working to make sure that it never happens again or to make sure that they can protect their families, they can protect themselves. So workaholism can be uh, a consequence or an effect of, uh, of people who have been sexually assaulted. Also, um, sleeping around, you know, being promiscuous, that can also be um, an effect. So one thing that I think we need to work on as a society is just being more accepting of men being vulnerable because we don't allow men to, we don't allow men to cry. We don't allow men to cry in public. We don't allow them to feel, um, to feel their own pain. And we, we need to do better with that so we can allow men to actually admit uh, what has happened to them. So just to kind of summarize some of the impact on self-esteem and self-worth uh, is that it could actually lead to two extremes, right? Where people are doing too much or they're doing too little. And the doing too much is when they're overstriving, either they're working to earn love because they, their self-worth self has been shattered to the point where they don't believe they're lovable. So they keep working. Um, they're working to appease the wrong because they feel a lot of shame and so they feel like they're the ones who did something wrong and so they have to like clean things up so they're working hard but they're working to be in control uh, they can also be promiscuous as i already stated where they their boundaries are completely destroyed and so they just begin to lose every sense of boundaries and um, go around and sleep with other people and have various sexual encounters with other people. Again, that also affects um, or relates to self-worth. Uh, also busyness to numb or to prevent from feeling. And part of what all of these says are that the person might not feel they are inherently lovable and so they need to work for it. For people who could be on the other extreme where they're doing too little, they kind of find this bubble of, a, of life that feels predictable, that feels safe. Maybe they have a routine that has worked. And so that routine is what they keep doing, right? And part of what that routine does is it avoids them from trying new things, from trying new, job, new jobs, new careers, from, from dating, from um, doing things that they really want to do uh, because they're afraid, right? There's a lot of fear. So they don't believe the world is safe anymore. And so this predictable routine that they have created that keeps them safe in this bubble. Um, and so that is also a way of hiding, kind of hiding um, and living, uh, living in what feels like a safe, safe place for them. Um, both of these ways of living are kind of living in survival mode. You're still kind of living in this place of surviving what happened to them. So of course it varies, right, per person in terms of um, how people are affected. Um, some people have less severe to, you know, more severe um, symptoms. So it, it varies per person. So how do we begin to build the self again? Um, so one thing that we want to believe is that you are lovable, you are loved, you are valuable, you have multiple talents and skills, and yes, you can. Yes, you can do whatever it is that you want to do, whatever it is that you set your mind to, you, you can still accomplish those things, right? So we want to start retraining, rethinking um, retraining the brain to believe, to start to believe um, all the valuable things that this person is. We want to believe that you can heal. You need to accept what happened to you and place the blame where it is meant to be, 
right? Well, it was not your fault. Uh, you couldn't have stopped it, right? And part of that goes along with recognizing the fight, flight, or freeze response, which we all have um, one of them that is our natural tendency when we, um, when we sense danger. Um, either we want to fight, like we want to fight the person either physically or verbally with words, or we want to run away from the situation or we freeze, right? And all of these three reactions happen um, while we are in danger. So in the sexual acts or in the sexual abuse, there is, there is no way sometimes that we would know how we will react to it, right? Because you really don't know what will happen until you are in that situation. And so you might find yourself reacting in either one of those. And um, that is just your response in trying to manage the trauma in that situation. So kind of, kind of understanding that you have these responses can help you recognize that there is nothing that you could have done to stop it. And also the absence of a no does not mean yes. So just the fact that you are resisting or you resisted is evidence enough for this person to stop. Because again, we don't know how we would have reacted in that situation. So even the fact that you resisted is enough for the person not to go along. You are not defined by what happened to you and you are still worthy of all the good things that life has to offer. I think my slides are okay. <laughs> so just my last kind of points talking to Christians um, who are married, because they're sometimes people use um, the scriptures in thinking, well, the wife should submit to the husband. And so like, was it really a big deal if somebody is married? And um, it, it is a big deal because the scriptures talk about um, man and wife um, submitting to each other or people submitting to each other, right? And 1 Corinthians 7 talks in detail about um, male and female, not male, husband and wife relationship. And you can go ahead and read the whole, um, the whole chapter at your own time. But this short passage, the first five verses, if you read it, um, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So if you just read uh, the places that are highlighted, um, it's talking to husband and wife, right? And there's kind of this interchange that goes on all the time. Like man should have his own wife, each woman, her own husband, husband, give to your wife, wife to your husband, wife, you know? So it's, it's a back and forth, which means that there is mutuality. There is mutuality in being able to recognize that your body belongs to both of you and his body belongs to both of you. And so you have to be on the same page um, to, um, in order to uh, love each other in this relationship. And so you can go again and look at the whole chapter because it says a lot more uh, about wife-husband relationship. And that can give some Christians just to rethinking our perception that it's okay for the woman to just allow um, uh, any form, you know, it, it's okay for people to be in these situations when 
um, it's your husband's. It, it's not. It's not true. So go back and, and read the, the passage. Well, I that is where I will end. I thank you guys again for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to seeing the chat because I don't know what is going on <laughs> there. Uh, but just a little bit about me again and my blog that Dr. Lil mentioned. So it's called African Mind Healer. You can go on there um, and look at it. I have a lot of information on there for um, on mental, various mental health topics and um, faith. And so it's a good resource. So you can go, go ahead and look at it. And I will stop sharing my screen. Oh, wow, a job that is that was so powerful just to hear you and to uh, that was you shared just such profound things today. And I really, really appreciate um, everything that you've shared and just um, bringing a lot of insight into topics we don't touch on a lot. I, I'm really glad that you spoke about the intersectionality with culture um, and how African culture may approach uh, these topics and how you know, our perception from a cultural standpoint may be a barrier uh, to self uh, help seeking behavior for people who've been victimized sexually and also bringing the faith-based perspective on it, um, which sometimes can be distorted um, when we're trying to um, when we're trying to twist it in in the favor of sometimes a perpetrator because he's a person in a position of power. You've shared so much, and I want to appreciate your wisdom and sharing your knowledge with us today um, to build the community to empower us to be informed about what can we do and how does that uh, impact our self worth. We barely scratched the surface yet. You shared so much. Um, because the impact on even mental health as a whole is really profound. Uh, you mentioned depression, you mentioned self-esteem, uh, suicidality, uh, PTSD, uh, substance use. It's just so much. And that's a really good segue for us to, as I introduce our, our second panelist today, who I am delighted and honored to have among us today. Um, I want to introduce to us my friend, um, Beatrice Ndura, who's a mental health coach, a spiritual coach, professional counselor, behavioral, behavior specialist, blogger, podcaster, author. I don't know when she does all these things. Motivational speaker. Uh, she has a master's degree in mental health counseling from Lancaster Bible College, which is also Capital Seminary and Grad School. She has a history of abuse and struggled with emotional wounds for a more significant part of her life. Storytelling, I love her storytelling, became one of her coping skills and a tool that helped her cultivate a path out of her pain. Beatrice taught herself how to deal with toxic emotions and charted her life in an emotionally healthy direction. She's passionate about coaching others on freeing themselves from negative emotions, carving a roadmap to deal with sabotaging emotional patterns in our personal lives, relationships, work environments, and developing self-mastery skills. Uh, she's worked for behavioral health rehabilitation services agencies in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and has experience working with children, adolescents, adults with mental, emotional, and behavioral challenges, which also includes um, people on the autism spectrum. Another set of experiences gained while working um, at Safe Harbor Christian Counseling of Lancaster, Pinnacle Praise, includes individual, family, and couples counseling in depression, anxiety, anger management, abuse, marital problems, spiritual coaching and self-development. She has done a whole lot and I am just honored to have her here. She's also a mother, she's, she's a wife, she's a grandma and I'm just delighted. She is a woman who speaks with such authority and boldness, she does not hold back. She's very candid and I like that about her and so she was just the right person to bring um, to our webinars today because I knew she would just go for it and talk about it. So I'm going to yield the floor to my friend, uh, this esteemed woman who's a voice in the community, uh, Beatrice Ndora, you're on Woman of God. Please unmute yourself. 
Okay. Thank you very, very, very much, my friend, Dr. Odela. You are a voice to reckon with. You are a very empowered woman. You don't camouflage yourself. I have known you as the woman who opens her chest and tells people, see, this is who I am. This is what I am struggling with. And this is how I am handling it. I salute you because women, we need to have women friends that we can open our chests and show each other and walk along each, each, uh, walk along each other. And thank you for the great job that you are doing. And thank you for having me. Dr. Amin, oh my goodness, what a powerful woman. I have just tasted you and I would like to taste you again and again. Your illustrations and presentation is very critical sound and also culturally sound. It is so diverse. You came in, in, in through many angles, the clinical angles, the life experiences, uh, the cultural aspect and the biblical aspect. You are a resource in our community and I applaud you. I applaud all the people who took time to tune into this webinar and I'm sure you are encouraged and this is why you keep on coming back again and again and may you continue to do so and the skills that have been transferred to you, may you transfer them wherever you go. I am a storyteller and I do not know how to do my thing without telling a story. In my presentation, it is a storytelling presentation. And I have two stories to share with you this afternoon in East Coast of America where I am and this evening in the East African time, if you are in that part of the world. I will start the story and the story is about myself. I will share the story and share the nuggets of wisdom and the skills. Um, I have a long history of abuse. Dr. Odera knows that since I was young. And uh, this uh, afternoon or this evening, I am focusing on the sexual abuse part of my journey. When I was 12 years old, I was sexually abused by a grown relative. When I was 13 years old, I was sexually abused by a gang of 10 big boys. My focus will be on the story of the gang of the 10 men, 10 boys. In school, I did not have many friends because I was the youngest. And I went to school in Kenya. And those were the days when girls used to come to Kenya and they are older and even some would drop out of school and go and get married. I was very young. I started school when I was six years old. And I was always the smallest and the youngest in the journey of my primary school education in my high school education. I did not have friends because most of these girls are older than me. And so to them, I am just a kid. And I remember when we had domestic science classes where the teachers were teaching girls how to behave and date and periods and all those kind of things, I was kicked out of that, that class because I was very young. And the teacher always asked me to go into the art class with the boys. And so my buddies were boys, not girls. And uh, I never knew anything when they were educated about their, their, their periods, when to expect them and what to do. I had not, no knowledge about that. 
And what the knowledge I got was from the boys because you know there were some girls who would sit down and stand up and their dress is messy and I could not understand why their, their dress is messy. And the boys would tell me, don't worry, these girls who mess up their dresses with blood, they go having sex with men. That is where the blood comes from. And I knew I was safe because I don't sleep with anybody, no sex with anybody. So I'll never have blood messing up my, my dress. So when I was 13 years old, we had a, a, a girl who had a small body, young, beautiful, vibrant, who joined our school. And she was very friendly and she was a social butterfly. And I, I was attracted to her and we became friends. And so she also had the relationship with boys. And so it was so good to finally have a friend. And, uh, and one time during the break, she invited me to take a break with her. And, and there was a, a load construction that was going by near the school. And she said, let's just go and see, take a break. Let's use our break by visiting the construction site. And, and the site where now they were building the, the, the bridge, there was a kind of a bush. I did not know that it was a setup. She had organized these tall boys, 10 of them, to ambush me. So when we got there, this is all she said. Here she is. And she ran away. And I am telling you, this gang of boys jumped on me, removed my clothes, terrorized me, violated me, did everything painful that I, I, I could not imagine. That was very, very difficult journey for me. But this journey remained a secret. I never told anybody I was sexually abused by a relative. And I never told anybody that I was abused or gang raped by 10 boys. And, uh, and, and so you, uh, and so, it was my secret and my suffering. And I can tell you from that time to all my life, to my adulthood, to my, because I, I addressed my, my, my pain, my big, huge history of abuse, including the sexual part. I started dealing with it when I was already, already married. But I can tell you this, I could not talk about it. I remember, in my village, one of the girls was sexually abused by a shopkeeper when she was sent by her mother to get some groceries. And I had my mother and a, and a group of women sitting down and talking about this, this girl and sharing the story. And the brain was on that girl. She was blamed for everything. At her home, she was blamed for everything. Now that I was violated, who would I trust with my story? I would not trust even my mother. I would not trust even any person in heaven and on earth with my story because I will be blamed. They will, they will talk of me as that loose girl, careless girl, seducing men. I internalized my pain for so many years, but it affected me in many different ways. This was trauma. And I can tell you, I had post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Because every day I relieved that scenario. Every day I felt the pain that I felt in that present moment when I was violated. And because I am a very bold woman and I am a courageous woman, I developed my own ways of dealing with it. 
So how do you deal with trauma? Because it traumatized me. I was traumatized. The other thing, I was so angry because at 12 and 13, I was transported to the world of grown-ups before my age. I was introduced to the world of the beautiful gift of sex that God has created to be exercised between a husband and wife. I was introduced in a very negative and dirty way. My innocence was taken away. I was angry of, of entering into a world that I was not prepared for. One of my favorite movies of all the time is Sound of Music. In fact, one time during Mother's Day, my son got me a DVD and they are sick and tired of me and that movie and I can watch it. I watched that movie when I was informed too. And I think I got stuck because I lived the life that I, that I missed. This innocent girl, 16, going on 17 and dancing with this boy who is 17. I am, I am 16, going on 17. I need someone older and wiser to introduce me into, the, into this world. And the boy is saying, I am 17 and older and wiser, I'll take care of you. I never had that kind of introduction to that world. And more to that, I never had sex education. So I had to find my way of dealing with my PTSD. I, you know, I diagnosed myself that when I grew older and, and got into graduate school and I knew that is exactly what I, I was dealing with. I became a very angry person. Anger was my middle name. I, I, I had great outburst of anger and I knew that was the way to control my, to, to be in charge. Because you see, when something is taken away from you, my control was taken away from me. And when something is taken away from you, you repress it with something. And you can repress it with something that is healthy or something that is unhealthy. And I repressed that which I lost with anger, outburst of anger. To me, anger made me very powerful. Anger was the showcase of who I am, of my, bride, of my pride. And I could do worse things with, with anger. I remember one time the, a, a girl messed up with me and said something about my past or whatever. And I am telling you, this is what I said. Meet me at 4 p.m. when the bell goes. And, and, the whole, and the boys and the girls would know there is a fight to come and watch. And so that girl was bigger than me and she came ready to fight me. I kicked her, I held her, and I dug deep on her side cheek with my teeth, and I spit the fresh on the ground. And today she still has that car, scar, and I'm not proud of, I'm not proud of that. I struggled with trusting people. I struggled with trusting people because I was afraid of being exploited again. I was afraid of being betrayed again. And, uh, and therefore, I became verbally aggression, that aggressive, that was my way of defending myself. I was emotionally unstable. My emotions were like a wave up and down and unpredictable. And, and I also had depression. Um, I lacked boundaries. I enjoyed isolations and I was a drama queen. 
And finally, I ended up drinking and smoking, which was out of, out of control. That is my, my story. Let me share the coping skills and, I, and how I coped with this journey. It uh, took away many years, but when I was already mature and, uh, and a young mother, I, I realized I have a big problem, but I did not know where will I get help? Who will help me? Who will I trust? I cannot live my life like this anymore. I feel like those people who violated me are still even controlling me from a distance. And I developed some skills that I never knew that they would be helpful. And uh, I would like to give God all the glory and honor because there was no therapy, no help. I worked on myself. I healed on myself, but it also gave me a desire to go to graduate school and graduate with my master's degree so that I can be able to understand people holistically from their spiritual, mental, and emotional health and be able to walk alongside their journey. One of the things that worked very well for me, I. I am the kind of a person who, who loves my personal space. And I would take my personal space and I would go to the nature. And I would start talking to myself. I would talk to the nature and tell the nature my story. And I would cry and show the nature my tears. I would rip off my wounds and I would show the nature my wounds. And the more I did that, the more I realized that it was easing of my pain. And so because I realized, oh, this has a remedy to my problem, I started practicing it over and over. I would even go to the river and talk to the river. And when there is wind, I would look up and let the wind uh, close over my face and talk to it. I would go where there are, there are trees in the bush and talk to the trees and the bush. It might sound crazy, but it became a positive coping skill for me. Instead of drinking and causing drama in the bus, this started working for me. The other thing is I like to write. And, um, and I like to read and I light every day. And if I don't light every day, even today, uh, I go crazy. So I would write my journey. I would write the, the stories of both scenarios and what happened. And I would write and write and write. And the more I did that, the more I was letting the pain out. The other thing I, I did in the context of writing, I started writing letters to my violators, people who abused me. I would put everything in a letter, which I never mailed anywhere and which I would hide in a very secretive place where nobody would find it. And I would tell them everything I feel about them and what they did to me. And I would pour it all in that letter. What I did, I kept those letters and I would read them over and I read them for a long time until the day I read them. Until the day I read them and the pain was less and less. And, and finally, I, I, I did not have that much pain. And uh, I, I will come to the, to the point of where 
how can we empower the people? So just bear with me. And um, the other thing was standing in front of the mirror and looking at myself and validating me, validating myself and uh, reminding myself I'm still good, I'm still worthy. And they did not take my authenticity away. They did not take my uniqueness away. They did not take my self-worth away. I still have it and I will perish it. And I will be a great woman who will change lives. And, uh, and then finally, the, the self-care. Self-care is very important. It is instrumental to our mental and emotional health. Because you really need to know that abuse damages your emotional health, your spiritual health, your physical health, and it steals your inner beauty and peace. And therefore, self-care is very, very important. And you have to identify what works for, for you. How does this help me? And how have I changed life? And how am I changing lives? My story, number one, it is powerful because I have a story and I have the skills, I have the clinical skills to enhance that story in the lives of those people who are in pain. Number one, I identify very much with people who have been abused and violated. I am able to understand them and I am able to encourage them to, to show them that they are still varied and to help them. Because you know, when you are sexually abused and, and Dr. Amin said that, I kept on saying it was my fault, if it is not my fault. And you know, that can go on. So I, I work with my clients to help them understand that this was not their fault. This was not their contribution. And this is something that was unavoidable because they did not even know that it was not planned. And this is what I tell people. I tell people, stand up and turn back and look behind. Look behind your history. And then speak to yourself this way. Yes, I was abused. And it was not my fault. I have no control over that piece of the past, but I have control over my present. And when I have control and over my I present, I am able to take back all the control that has been stolen away from me. And, uh, and then we would work on different scenarios in how to get your control back and how to be in charge of your life. And I'm just giving this in brief because I cannot be able to give all this in a, in a nutshell. People who have been violated, they are able to identify with somebody with a story. They are encouraged to heal when they see you have healed and you have completely been healed. We change life because we create awareness. We speak to the community. We speak to people who, who, who like don't believe that people were abused or they take that as a, as, a, as a narrow to shoot these people. So creating that awareness, and this is why this month is sex assault month. It is what we do with our, with our lives. We are able to, 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 to hear the pain and we are able to give the skills that will help that person in their journey. People do very well when they are heard and when they are understood and when they come to realize they are not crazy with all the things that goes on with their head and they can, they can, they can engage in cognitive restructuring and restructure their journey in another, in another direction. And let me briefly share this second part of the story because Dr. Amin said, in our African culture, we are ignorant about the pain that men go through. And uh, men are also sexually abused. And I'll share this story. Somebody came to see me. He was sexually abused when he was 12 years old. 
And by 65, things had gotten out of control. And uh, when, when he came to see me, and I'll just be brief with this, the, uh, the abuse was so much. And I saw a 65-year-old man weeping like a 12-year-old boy. He went back to, to the childhood, to the stage of being 12. He relieved that pain in my presence, and that is the pain he relieved on the daily basis. And this, this pain was so cancerous because it, has, it destroyed his marriage, it destroyed his career, and now he was in thousands and thousands of dollars in debt. And, and, and this is how it affected him. And I think Dr. Amin also talked about that. It can lead you into some other addiction to pornography, to prostitution and that, those kind of things. And he looked at me in the eyes and said, I, I buy drugs every day because that's my coping skill. And I sleep with seven prostitutes every day and I can never get enough of that. And now I am, I have nothing left because sleeping with seven prostitutes every day, that's a lot of money. Buying drugs every day, that is a lot of money. Then the health impact, it's a lot of money on doctors. Was there hope in this kind of a, of a person? I listened to, to it. And uh, you can tell the trauma, the financial trauma, the mental health trauma, the emotional health trauma, and his spiritual health trauma because he was still trying to go to church. The loss of the family, the loss of job, the loss of trust, the loss of a home, and all that is a huge loss. But there is hope, and this is, uh, for me, I'm a Christian woman, and I believe that in the midst of all the clinical work we do, our goal is to give people hope. Because those who know their God shall do exploits. And we are so influential, even in the midst of people who do not know God, not that we are shoveling down the gospel in their throat, but the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us is very transformational, not just in our lives, but even in the lives of those people we commit to God in prayer. And I have to talk about prayer very carefully because I have realized most people, prayer, they learn into prayer as a, as a coping skill and a denial, denying their, their pain and not addressing it. But working with him and him realizing I am able to understand and, and him and helping him to make peace with his past. And I'm just doing a general thing because we don't have time here, you know, to show you how to make peace with your past or how to take steps to, you know, to do that with your, with your past. We were able to work together and finally get him to a rehabilitation where he was for many years. And, uh, and finally he was able to, uh, to put his life together. So when we develop the right skills to deal with our pain, when we come out of denial, when we stop numbing our emotions, when we stop being angry and just you know, focusing on those people who violated us, we are able to move on. When we find ways of expressing our, our anger, instead of acting it out, when we are able to identify the invitations to this anger, the memories and everything, and deal with them in the right way, we are able to move on with our, with our lives. We are able to set boundaries because boundaries are, are very, very essential. And uh, boundaries help us to stay healthy and they also help other people to stay healthy. So we are able to work on those, those, uh, those boundaries. And, uh, and we are able to connect with our uniqueness, which makes us great in so many ways. 
we are able to connect with our authenticity because our story is ours. It's authentic. It is unique, depending on what direction you want to you wanna like to take it. And so my story is my badge of honor, uniqueness, authenticity. And my story is the way I connect with people because my heart goes for all those who have gone through abuse and I have all the grace to listen to them and walk along beside them, establishing healthy boundaries, graduating from self pity parties, graduating from brain, and, 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 and graduating from loss and helping them grieve their loss. Because like I said, we have grieved many years for the loss, but we can grieve that loss in a healthy way and, and graduate. And uh, thank you so much for sharing. That is my contribution, and God thank God be with you. Wow! 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 Oh, is there an echo? I'm sorry. Sorry, are you hearing an echo on my end? Yes, we can hear an echo. All right. All right. All right. All right. Hey, I'll let you talk a bit so I can fix my audio. Sure. Wow. Beatrice, thank you so much for that. There's just, even just sharing your story so vulnerably, I, I appreciate your sharing this with us um, and even just sharing the pieces of what, what helps you to get through, right? Like I could just imagine you talking to the river, talking to nature and journaling um these are all really helpful tools for us like it's for me i'm thinking oh these are things that i can recommend to my clients so thank you so much i appreciate um the story of you're welcome what you've shared definitely moved <sighs> yeah so i i have a question of just um because sometimes people don't want to be referred to as survivors. I've heard that. And, you know, some people are comfortable having that title of, yeah, I'm a survivor, but some people have a problem with it. And I, I'm just wondering of your take on that. I, I think for me, I have never looked at it through that way, uh, a survivor. For me, I look at it as a, as a hero in the journey. And I am a hero in the journey because I have not given up. I have embraced my weaknesses. I have embraced my struggles and I have embraced my strengths. A survivor has, to me, a survivor has a kind of uh, uh, a degree of self-doubt and wishy wishy because well you you can be in that survival mode you know and I think even in the Bible we are not called to be survivors we are called to be conquerors because we can do all things through Christ who strengthen us and so when you have this kind of uh, a survivor mentality, you need to say that I am, I am healing in the journey. I am getting, am better, getting in the, better in the in the journey because it is in the in the in the journey. Uh, and and to be very honest with you, this is an an, an ever ending journey. You still find another area that you really wanna wanna work on. When you Look at yourself through the eyes of a survivor. You, you don't extend the grace to yourself to look from where you have come from and where you are. You, you don't get those opportunities to, to reward yourself. And, and let me mention to you that what I did in my journey when I talked to the trees and the rivers and I started realizing something is happening. Every time I felt that way, I would reward myself either buying myself a, a book I want to read or 
or, or going out somewhere with friends. So I, I kept on rewarding myself. And if I am rewarding myself, I'm saying, I am conquering. I conquered this, yay, I'm rewarding my, myself. So I think a survivor kind of sometimes pulls you in your past and you can get stuck there. And you know, Dr. Amin, I say, past doesn't have much value when we are working on things like this because it takes you back to your pain. Skills are not developed in the past and we do not heal in the past. We have to move to the present moment to heal, to develop skills and to project to a better and healthy future. Oh, that's well said and a, a great perspective of just being able to look at what happened to you, but you're constantly on the journey of healing and, but you're seeing the steps that you're taking and you're kind of encouraging yourself through that by even just giving yourself some rewards along the way. That's, that's a great perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that's profound. Please tell me my audio is better now. Yes. <laughs> yes. <it is. laughs> okay. I am sorry. Today I have a lot of technical issues. I think I have three devices open at the same time. Um, <laughs> I want to appreciate, oh my goodness, I the vulnerability. I hope um, you can see the chat box and see the comments that people are putting in there. Um, because it takes a survivor to be able to empower other survivors to step up. And I so want to appreciate um, your boldness. I always think of your middle name, uh, Beatrice, as boldness and courageous because I've seen you share your vulnerability so that somebody else can be empowered. And I can't underscore the importance of that because most of us are listening quietly in the background and I'm pretty sure everybody on here, I wish I could say no, but I'm pretty positive that everyone here can think of somebody who's been victimized in your life personally, whether it's yourself, somebody in your network, somebody in your family, somebody you know, somebody in your church, somebody in your city, in your village, in you know who's been victimized and you're silently taking this in and I'm hoping we take that to empower somebody else to give a voice to a lot of victims um, who are still trying to be survivors. Because being a victim was never anybody's choice, but being a survivor is a brave choice to make. And that's what I'm hearing from the both of you empowering us. When we set this up, I was not sure, you know, are people gonna show up, you know, what was going to be the experience we have and, um, and how are people going to, are people going to willing to be willing to have the conversation? And I think this is really brave that we stepped into this space to be able to do this. And I'm, I'm just so honored to be a part of what we are doing here. And you, you shared so much that I actually don't even know what to add on to. And a lot of people are asking, so what do I do? How can I help victims? How can I empower others? And you know, today I'm, I'm not probably as organized as I usually am because of my, the issues I'm having with my, my um, technology. But I just want to mention that you can do a lot. You can be that voice. You can be that person who speaks up um, for people who've been victimized. You can, you can become an interrupter. You know, how do you help survivors? You can listen. Um, and communicate without judgment uh, by not using those words of it was your fault, but in validating people. And, you know, you can just be there. You know, if the survivor seeks medical attention, be there. I, they want to make a report, be there. They want somebody to listen, be there. Just make that offer. You don't have to have this perfect words to say, just show up um, and encourage the survivors to get support where you can. And I know it can be violating for survivors sometimes to have to go through um, a rape test, like when they bring the rape kids to the hospital and they want to, to draw samples and all. It can be violating, but boy, it can change a life, but that is their choice. 
we can't tell them you need to, you have to those because it takes power from them. So we want to empower them. So we are present, we offer support, we share resources like RAIN um, and have them get connected and be patient. There is no timetable for recovering from trauma. Uh, Beatrice just shared somebody who was, was assaulted at 12 and at 65, they were finally beginning to find their voice. So people can't recover on your time. And as especially I look at most of you on here are believers uh, and Christ believers. And you know how sometimes we can say, are you trusting in God for healing? And we can be very condemning and saying, if you believed in God more, the trauma would go away. Be patient because the impact is, I like how you both shared um, about how staggered it can be and how uh, the domino effect of the impact on your on yourself as a person, on your family, on your capacity to speak up, on your capacity to be emotionally intimate, your capacity to engage with others, to be sexually intimate. And it can corrode a lot, so be patient. Avoid putting pressure on, it, on them to engage in activities. Maybe if you went on a date, you'll be better. Maybe do not push, do not judge. And I like how you spoke about self-care. Um, encourage them to do self-care and be present to say, I will do it with you. Um, and some of, you know, and, and step away from, I'm just echoing what they already shared, step away from invalidation. You're overreacting. It's not that serious. It was your fault. Um, denim day is coming up. If you don't know den denim day, I'm going to have you look it up. And that was a sexual assault case in Italy where the judge ruled in favor of the perpetrator and said that the victim, and I'm summarizing, the victim was wearing tight jeans. So there's no reason why they could have been assaulted and that they did not take out their clothing for the assault to happen. Again, in another case in Italy, the, um, the attorney was holding um, tongs, underwear of the 17 year old victim and saying, if you wear this kind of underwear, of course you're going to be violated. And so you want to know how you can give a voice to a victim. And when something like that happens, step up there. And I know culturally, sometimes you'll say, oh, Alita Futa, that person was looking for it. Step away from invalidation. Uh, don't tell them it could have been worse. Even though you're like, oh, they, at least they didn't kill you. You know, Don't say stuff like that. Don't tell them it could have been worse because that is a traumatic experience that could change their whole life. Don't say, what's a big deal? Or at least you have at least this, don't minimize. Um, so you're asking what you can do, be present, watch the language you're using to communicate. Uh, do not laugh at jokes that put others down, especially in um, when we're having sexual conversations about sexual activity, get active consent from your partner or from make sure people are getting consent. Don't laugh at sexist jokes. Um, they're saying, oh, that's just women. Oh, they're just being, you know, people are using the B word or the W word or whatever word. Educate your friends, your family, especially if you hear that kind of terminology coming from them. Be the disruptor and say, hey, you know, interrupt that disrespectful conversation that goes on and say that is not right. I've talked about show compassion for survivors. Um, treat partners, peers with respect, learn the facts about sexual assault. We just learned today that even men get sexually assaulted. Adult men, not just young boys, adult men get sexually assaulted. And I started off by talking about what constitutes sexual assault. And so it doesn't have to be penetration for that to be sexual assault. And it doesn't have to be a man to a woman. It can happen in any setting. You can be starting, standing in line at the post office and somebody brushes against you in a manner that is violating, that is sexual assault. Say something when you hear disrespectful language. Listen to and believe survivors. Do not challenge them. Learn about the root uh, that the, of the issues that lead to assault. Create a safe space for people to say no. Create a space if you're in a public place, you went to a party and you, know, you can see somebody's hitting on somebody else. And they're kind of like, and this person is like, no, don't touch me like that. Be the disruptor and join, join the table. Go sit there and say, hey, so what's been going on? Create a safe space for somebody else to not be violated in your presence. 
um, sometimes it's a risk you will have to take, but you may save a life, even in a restaurant. Be the one who says, hey, I was looking for directions to this and this place. Interrupt that interaction. So you may save somebody's life who's just crying out for help and needs somebody. Because the body language of somebody who has been especially chronically assaulted, you can pick up on it. They're scared. They're terrified. They're not talking. They're tolerating disrespect. They're tolerating language that's inappropriate. Be the disruptor. Those are some things we can do. And um, Ajab talked a, a very well about boundaries. Ask people about their boundaries. I even ask people, are you okay with this person saying that to you? And sometimes they've lost their voice. They need somebody else to help them find their voice. Do not be judgmental and say, oh, women from, you know, I know in Kenya, sometimes we have this joke and correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, women from Nyeri. Oh, men from Kiambu. Let's refrain from that kind of promoting and propagating that kind of language because that man from Nyeri may be sitting right there and he's the one who gets beat up by his wife. You want to make sure you're being the interrupter and in promoting healthy living, healthy relating. Um, I, I want to, um, to wrap it up there um, because there's just so many things we could share with you um, about this topic, but I just want to hold it up there. I'm sorry I was not able to share my slides today. Uh, but I'll be able to share this. There are a lot of resources. I think I've seen some of the providers here share resources um, on the chat box. And actually, before I wrap up, I just want the providers who are here to speak up so we know you are there in case somebody needs to inbox you and connect with you. I think I saw Brenda, I saw Esther, I saw Julia. Can, can you all just um, Speak up and say your names um, so people just know you're part of the village and you're available to support the community. Um, hi, this is Julia Sana and I am in West Palm Beach, Florida. For anyone who needs um, resources or therapists or just being pointed out in this direction on what to do with recovery from uh, sexual violence sexual abuse and actually sexual manipulation as well. I did put some resources in the chat box, especially about grooming, because that's what we've experienced as African children and what uh, children here in the West also experience. Unfortunately, it goes across the cultures and it was a real blessing hearing from Ajab and hearing from Beatrice, um, the stories and the differences and, and dealing with assault. Um, so I wanted to just mention about the grooming part of it that I really want us to be aware of that, especially in churches as well. A lot of us have experienced that where we know there's abuse going on in churches and when you tell the leaders nothing happens about it or the woman is told that it's her fault or she's a Jezebel. Um, so we need to be aware of that and be able to stand up for the victims and in supporting them. And I'm speaking about stuff that I've done in highlighting incidents of abuse or bringing information out to church leaders and letting them know that this might possibly be happening. So don't be afraid to be okay. And in the community, I also wanted to mention, especially for us in Africa, the house help, the people we have at home watching our children are often the first abusers of the children. So please go through the grooming behaviors, look at that list or go online, look at that list and be careful to listen to your child. If your child or your daughter, your son, and the, even if the teenagers and hints, something is going on, please do not doubt them and do not punish them. Just listen to them. Children never lie about things like that. They do not lie about things like that. Just listen to them because they are telling you, first abusers always have immediate contact to the child. Um, and so that's what I wanted to share. And thank you so much, Dr. Lillian for hosting this. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, other providers out there who want to share something? Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, my name is Judy Olipere and I am based in Dallas, Texas. Um, first of all, I'm very, very grateful for this platform and I appreciate you, Dr. Harris, for putting us together. Um, I am a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner based here in Dallas. 
I am in private practice, um, which I started recently. And my plea is just for uh, people to do everything that has been said by all the speakers. Please call on up and, and just reach out for help. I also want um, to say this, and I've said this in, in another platform, that I am open and I'm available to um, help where I can as far as medication management is concerned and a little bit of therapy, especially for our people. Um, I am licensed in Texas and Arizona. I'm currently doing only telepsych, so you can reach me. And, and especially for us here in diaspora, the, the mamas who are living with us, helping us with children. I know people don't have insurance. I am open to doing uh, pro bono work for my people. Something as little as simple as insomnia is taken as just anything. Oh, I don't sleep and I'm used to it. It is not normal. There is a problem behind that insomnia and I'm, I'm available to, to just offer help and, you know, it can be free, it can be on a sliding scale, but I want my people to not suffer when I'm here and I can help. So anybody in Arizona, anybody in uh, Texas that needs um, any kind of mental health, kindly reach out to me. I'm also on Facebook and also um, Dr. Liliana Odera can give our contacts since she already has all our contacts. Thank you and God bless you, bye. Oh, thank you, Judith. Definitely, we're gonna reach out. We're definitely going to reach out. Hello, Any other everyone. providers? Go ahead, Esther. Yes, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, wonderful. I, I want to say so much gratitude and thank you to all the presenters. I just sat here and allowed myself to hear, and I was mesmerized by the work that both of you put together to put the presentation and even becoming more vulnerable. Um, so I thank you both uh, for taking time to speak on this most difficult topic. I mean, I don't think a lot of people bring this kind of issues because they are never sm spoken into a community. Uh, but, I, but I think uh, it's important that we get to a place where we come together like the way we are here to talk about this. And I would want to see more men. I, I am so grateful that we have one man, one, one man here. I don't know whether, I, uh, whether there is another one over here because this, import, uh, this important topic is, is for us as, as keepers and also as parents, it's not just the women, but also men too. If you're having kids, uh, are they speaking about those things, uh, whether they are being violated when they are out there? And so we can work together as a team, even in, as in family, uh, if, if the men is also putting their work and, and women are also putting their work. Uh, thank you, Beatrice. Uh, you talked so much about trauma. I work with a lot of work that I do is trauma-based. And I mean, uh, all what you shared is something that I would like to even have coffee with you to talk more about those different scenarios that you've used. I know a lot of clients that I see that struggle mostly with talking about trauma are usually men because it's, it's just really difficult for them to come and talk about somebody else had more power um, and violated them. And I'm talking about men who have been violated when they are adult. So this one not, didn't happen when they were little kids, it happened when they were adult. And so it's really difficult for them to talk about those issues. And so um, like learning ways in which even I could support them that way. So thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here. It's wonderful to see you all. I am in Minneapolis, so everybody can know that. I am in Minneapolis. I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker here. And I'm also a psychotherapist. And I also do a little bit of consultancy. Thank you all. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. You're one of our resident experts here, and I appreciate the work. She actually specializes in working with victims of torture um, and trauma, so you can reach out to her if you need consultation. Um, anybody else there? Hey, um, I just wanted to say something. 
I want to really appreciate the speakers today. Uh, my name is Zipora Ngarama. I am a licensed social worker here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I practice um, out of the Penn Medicine Lancaster General Health as a maternal child health uh, provider. Now, I just want to say something to that effect. One of the things, really beautiful things that has happened in our hospital now is the recognition uh, of the fact that, that there's women who are coming in for physical treatment and, and especially when they come in to deliver their babies uh, who have post-traumatic stress related to uh, sexual assault from before. So to that effect, we have created um, or we, I am part of a committee that was formed to address those kinds of needs. And there's nurses on board who meet with these patients and they help them uh, go through their procedures um, more or less comfortably. And so that has been a successful intervention. However, it's, it, it came to our attention that after the delivery of the babies and after they've undergone their procedures successfully, they go out there and still have to face the real world day to day. Like I had one of the mothers who she successfully delivered her baby, um, her first baby, then who was a daughter she did beautifully. Then she came back to us when she became pregnant again and went through our program, delivered her son beautifully again. Three months out, she was having difficulty breastfeeding because set of, of, of trauma related to the memory of assault by her very own father. And this child, you know, favors her father in the way you know, he looks. And so every time she'd put him to the breast, she would have these flashbacks that would really just make her push the baby away. And before you know it, you know, it spirals down to other things like even suicidal ideations and stuff, depression and all. So all that to say that I'm so happy that today our speakers really like outline some of those impact uh, issues that we have to address. And, and I'm just giving you an example of how maybe in my entity we've done this. Also, real quick, I wanted to share with you, and Esther, I know we need to, to connect with this, uh, on this, is uh, that we have another population of African immigrants, especially from the Congo, who have become, have uh, kind of been catapulted into that position of serving them. And um, in that, um, in that, a lot of them have suffered sexual assault while they were running for their lives um, in the Congo, uh, in the war-torn Congo. And so that we are seeing a lot of trauma related to that. And um, so I hope that um, as we continue meeting here and sharing uh, that we, you know, that, that, that we will become better at advocating and counseling and uh, providing therapy for those that are coming out of these uh, circumstances. And one more thing, I would like to kindly uh, recommend that we, we probably look into uh, like the, the you know, like let's say your child comes to you or any other person in the community and discloses to you that they have been sexually assaulted and just the step-by-step -step, uh, of the fast aid of that. How, how do you handle that? Um, I, I don't know if all of us here are necessarily doing sexual assault counseling uh, or rather prevention counseling and and teaching and stuff like that. So that's just an appeal. Thank you. Thank you, Zippy. Some really good points there. Um, it takes a village uh, for us to do this work. 
Um, you don't have to be an expert in doing this work, but you can let us know, use the resources. As you're hearing this, providers mark their names, and if you need to reach out, let me know and you want to connect to them in your area. Um, we need to wrap up. Do we have a few more people? Brenda, I see you there. Did you want to say a quick hello? You're our resident expert in uh, sexual health and reproductive health. Hi, uh, this is Brenda. I'll just say a quick hello. I live in Toronto, Canada. I, my specialty is in uh, mental health and sexuality, and I'm also a social and behavioral consultant. I'm always glad to attend these meetings. I'm kind of overwhelmed listening to our sister Beatrice and Dr. Amin. You guys just did it. You, you integrated, you integrated, you integrated culture and mental health and sexuality. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you so much for the providers. I'd like to encourage everyone who's in here, if you're struggling with something, please reach out. Help is out there. Dr. Odera has the resources. We have a lot of providers. Do not shy away. You need quality of life. Love you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> Anybody else? I think I saw Mama Nestor. Theory, are you still on? Yes, I am. All right, Mama. You I... know I always want you to say something. Okay, thank you very much. Odera, Dr. Odera and all the participants. I give a lot of credit to Beatrice and Dr. Amin. I'm just struggling with what Beatrice is saying because here when people are, the children, either boys or girls are assaulted, sexually assaulted by relatives, they are told, don't talk about it, don't talk about it. And because of culture and poverty and shame, People want to set that aside, they can, they can pay money, they can pay and go, and it really, really puts me off. I always tell the people, they, the, the women, to, to ask them, both the girls and the boys, whether somebody have been, have been with them or asked them, because a lot of people here think it's only the, boys, the girls who can be sexually assaulted. And the last few months when during this COVID time, somebody came to cut trees for me. And as he left my gate, I asked him, how many children do you have? It was my first encounter with him. And he told me two boys. I told him during this COVID time, please talk to the boys, to go talk to the children so that they don't get assaulted or abused. He said, I have boys. I said, even boys. Then he said, he told me, oh, mom, my son had already been assaulted and he was also abused in, sexually abused in the church. So I've been, he, the person who assaulted him, him was a, a teacher in the church compound. And um, it has gone on and on, but I have been calling him because the, the family of the, assault, the, the abuser had asked it to pay a hundred thousand shillings to cool the matter. But I told this boy, he is a young father, I told him whatever, I called him and I told him, if ever you miss food and you feel like you want to take that money, don't take the money, come to me, I'll say whatever I have to help you, but let this go to the law. But I'm still following up the case, but we need to encourage our people, especially the older women and the young mothers, because a lot of times they leave children unattended. They are in the village and the people who are in drugs, they take them, they abuse them and tell them, if ever you say this, I'll, I'll, I'll kill you. So this is only for me and for you. It's a little sad we need to educate the community and uh, we, uh, Beatles, I congratulate you. You did it, but this is just because of the help of God. Yes. And let's also not have double standards because a lot of us think if we are in the church, it can never happen there. And when it happens in the church, even in the church family, where the girls are abused by the, the fathers, it's never told. Today is a Saturday, and every morning there is something which comes on Kameme. 
And there are people who will say they have given birth from their father, and this was never talked about. And it really, really makes my heart pain. But we can do this one day at a time. And we, whoever we reach, we educate the people to have no missed opportunities. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all. I love you all. Let's do what we can for the growth of God in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mama. Thank you so very much for, for sharing that. Wow, this is, this is a lot of really good networking and communication and edification um, and empowerment. And um, let, let's, let's work and build the village. Um, we're going to wrap it up here, um, unless there was any provider there that absolutely wanted to just say your name and let us know where you are. Is there anybody, just say, introduce yourself, anybody that I, I could be leaving out? Yes, good evening. My name good evening. Is I'm a clinical psychologist based in Akuru, and I really want to appreciate uh, Dr. Lady, Dr. Amina, and Beatrice for sharing your story. I just had one quick one to ask. If in your practice you've come along, I mean, across um, victims, I don't need to call them victims now, that, that have been abused not once, twice how do you want to understand what is this that makes them so vulnerable that they go through it not words i would really appreciate that mm. that is a good question that needs another hour to respond to <laughs> um we can certainly since you're a provider actually this is a good place to plug in we have a provider circle um, that meets um, mm -hmm. every month. So we have our meeting coming up, um, I think on the 24th, two Saturdays from today, we have a provider circle and we come together as mental health providers from different places. And that's one of the questions we can usually talk about. How do you help people who've been chronically abused or children who've been exploited? And how do we, do we help? Um, and how do we also work on not letting this take a toll on us individually as providers when this goes on a lot and you're carrying a lot, you have a holding space for so much. So we can also continue that conversations in the provider circle. I'll encourage everybody here who's in the profession to join us in two weeks. I'll send out an announcement. And if you, you don't follow us on social media, we have uh, two pages. One is for uh, promoting African mental health that's general for the general African village and community to come and get information. And I actually want providers to become contributors in responding to questions that people ask about mental health in making yourself available to the village. And we also have another page, which is a network of African mental health providers. And that's where I want us to get together as providers to build a network where we can help the community to do that. And we'll have a meeting in two weeks. But to wrap us up, I want to appreciate our panelists today. I want to appreciate Dr. Amin and, uh, and Beatrice, powerful, powerful women of God. I appreciate you so much. All the providers who are here who've contributed, all your comments, all your feedback. There are a lot of resources on the chat box and uh, we have uh, live streamed this on Facebook. So if you want to go and see a rerun of it, you can do that or share the link with others. I've also recorded this and I will, those of you who registered, I will send you an email with a link to the YouTube channel where you can also go and view this or share it with people in your network. Um, and so again, my appreciation for being brave, every one of you, for being so brave to log on so we, you can be a part of this conversation and we can save a life, we can change a life, we can change the course of somebody's life um, and they can really work through their trauma and build their strength from that place of trauma um, and be able to move forward. Their life does not end with the trauma. It, it's a stepping stone to a new chapter, a new beginning. Um, and I see uh, Julia is sharing the link there to where you can find us. Um, we do appreciate you logging in. We will have another uh, African mental health webinar a month from today. I just want to highlight that this is our, our year anniversary. We had our first one a year ago. Mm. Uh, when the pandemic set in, we started building a village, a place to do this. And I appreciate those of you who've stuck it out with me. Julia has been my co-host um, 
presenter, co-host, and we've tagged him to make sure this is going on. And all my regular faithfuls, it is our first year anniversary. I'm not making a big deal of it because I want us to just build the village uh, continually. This is a labor of love. This is purely a labor of love. And it gives me great joy to just see people built in the community. So I want to wish everybody a beautiful rest of the weekend. And we'll see you providers in two weeks. Everybody else will see you in a month. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Dr. Lil, one quick question that someone asked is, are men who are service providers welcome to the provider circle? Yes. Yes. Uh, we actually have a few male providers who show up. Uh, to a provider circle. I want to appreciate Ignatius. I don't know if he left. He's one of my guy friends. Um, we serve in the ministry together. He's been so brave to log on here week in, week out, even if he's the only guy in the webinar, he comes in. So Ignatius, man of God, I appreciate you. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon or evening or night. Your time zone determines what time of day it is. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all too. Thank you. Thank Dr. you, Miss Martha Chebet. I appreciate you, Mama. Thank you, yeah, Judith. I'm gonna get in touch. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Mama Nesta. You are a Thank powerhouse. You. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Nice weekend. Love you all. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Bye.